Do you have activism on your bookshelf? Welcome to Activist. I'm Gareth. And I'm Jackie. Today we have the pleasure of talking to MC Ronan. Maya, as she is otherwise known, is a passionate animal advocate and she is also the author of fantastic activism novels The Shed and its sequel Liberation. Today we discuss the inspiration for both of her books and why they deserve a place on any activist bookshelf. If you like this content, then please smash that like button, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and keep up to date with all the brilliant videos that we do. We really hope you enjoy this as much as we did. Thank you so much for joining us today, Maya. It's great to finally meet you. Um, for all our viewers around the world watching this, could you just tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? My name is Maya and I'm vegan. I've been vegan for about eight and a half years or so. I don't have a vegan anniversary actually. I don't really remember. Um, it's about eight and a half years and I'm a vegan animal rights activist. I've been an activist for about as long as I've been vegan. And uh, I'm also an author of vegan books and a mother. And, um, you know, you're one busy lady. We already know that you are one of New Zealand's most prominent activists. But one thing we've never known is what led you to actually become vegan in the first place. So um, would you mind sharing your story? We've all got one. I'd love to hear it. <laughs> sure. Uh, thank you for the prominent. I don't know if I'm that prominent. But um, um, so I wish I could say that I was uh, that I was born vegan, I can't. I wish I could say that I turned vegan at various stations in my life where it was almost um, requested, that it was almost needed. It could have avoided, I could have avoided so many problems and so many heartaches, but I can't. I, <laughs> I actually turned vegan. Um, I was already a mother. My son was uh, very interested in whales and dolphins and sharks and all kinds of sea uh, creatures. And through his enthusiasm, through his the joyous interest that he uh, showed um, in sea life, I kind of was sucked into it, especially with sharks. And through that interest, I discovered Sea Shepherd. And... Um, with and I really fell in love with what they do. I, did, I realized what's going on at the Southern Sea, at the Ross Sea, the the whaling, the the atrocities that are happening there um, at the time by the Japanese fleet and also in Taiji, the Kovo Taiji in Japan. And because you know everyone loves dolphins, whales, and some of us love sharks too. <laughs> and um, I had this obsession about Sea Shepherd, you know, it was a very, um, it, it was so powerful because that was a first for me, uh, discovering a whole new world of, of badness that was happening right under my nose and I didn't know about it. And I had this real kind of vision or, I don't know, a dream or something that one day when my son is old enough, him and me and I will go you know, to on, on a sea shepherd uh, boat to <laughs> rescue whales and, you know. And then um, I read and I realised that it said that the sea shepherd, uh, all the sea shepherd ships are purely vegan. And I thought, oh, that's a bit harsh. Why, <laughs> Why are they vegan? <laughs> and, um, and I started just delving into it. I just started researching. And I started reading. I didn't know anything about dairy, anything at all. Because, you know, most of people understand when you eat meat, it comes from a dead animal. but And you kind of push it to the side. But I had absolutely zero understanding of where dairy comes from. You can, the cows give us milk. What the big deal? You press the button, comes the milk. Yay, they're happy. <laughs> the amount of, the level of ignorance that I was showing is just, yeah, it's, inexplic it's inexcusable, not at the age I was at. And um, it, once I've absorbed all that information, I, I had, I, I just, I remember that moment of, that overwhelmness of it. 
and I was standing in the kitchen and I was cutting whatever salad and I and my husband was there and I thought and I just said you know we need to go vegan he was already vegetarian at the time and I was not I was omnivore and um, he said oh what why you know we're vegan you know what it crazy um, and I said no we have to be we have to go vegan and I that's it and that was the moment that was the watershed moment and that's it. I've been vegan since that moment. And um, he joined me about two weeks later. He did some research as well because he didn't know about dairy as well and eggs and stuff and all the chicks that are being grated alive and all, all the absurdities that, that, that are very well hidden from the public. And our children are vegan. So, yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> Thank it's you so much for sharing that on the uh, talk about family goals, eh? Like uh, that'd be <laughs> awesome to get out on the ships. But yeah, so many of us, you know, uh, once you realize um, what we've been doing, you know, just wish you could go back and be vegan from the start. But yeah, so wonderful learning your uh, your transformation there. And um, mm. yeah, so, so good on you. But um, as well as being just a wonderful, lovely vegan, um, being such a, a wonderful activist, what was it that got you into activism at first? Was there a particular event that drew you in? I, um, at the time, was watching a lot of, um, I didn't know a lot of vegans. I actually didn't know any vegans in my area. It was like, you, it was only eight and a half years ago, but it was a world, a world ago. You know, it was a lifetime ago what happened in the, in the movement since then. And um, I was actually following on social media, the Israeli, uh, um, they were the Animal Liberation Front at the time, names changed and whatever, but at the time they were called Animal Liberation Front and I love their, what they were doing. They were so bold and they were so um, outwardly vegan and proud and it, they had that energy, that energy that something was going on, something is happening, there's an earthquake. And I wanted but I wanted that. I wanted this here, and it wasn't at the time. There was nothing like it at, at the time. But I felt that something, I can't just say, oh, I wish it happened here if I'm not doing anything. So I was just basically looking for whatever, <laughs> whatever was happening at the time in Wellington. There was this umbrella organization that was um the animal um network the animal rights network i don't think they exist anymore but maybe there but there's nothing happening with them at the time at this, this time but they were then they had this vigil planned and yeah i just came i just said oh yeah i'm going to this vigil the vigil was at the um slaughterhouse um at the Nauranga gorge that leads to the slaughterhouse and uh, i just ch I, I made my own sign and just came i just and when i when i got there i actually made friends and connections and that's how i kind of you know went into it um you have to kind of start somewhere so sitting at home and saying, oh, I wish something happened, you know, something, someone has to do something about it. Well, you are someone, do something about it. Yeah. Oh, that's so. fantastic. And, you know, I mean, you haven't really stopped since, have you? <laughs> Doing things and make things yeah. happen. Um, I mean, we see you, you know, as, as New Zealand activists, we see you pop up literally all over the place in events and uh, activist groups. Have you got a favorite kind of form of activism? I'll do anything, honestly. I'll do anything. I'll do anything uh, with the proviso that it's um, peaceful, non non-violent. So we are not violent. We we might receive violence, um, but we are not the violent part. In that, um, yeah. So that's basically, and and that I can see how it how it can how it can further the message. So I need to see some some benefit behind that action. There are very limited number of actions where I can't see anything beneficial happening as a result. So I've been doing anything. I I've, I love the way we do things here in, in Wellington and generally in New Zealand, that even though I'm an organiser for the, the Animal Save movement here in Wellington, 
I join other groups all the time. Um, so I, I will join Direct Action Anywhere doing their you know, disruptions and I'll join Mothers Against Dairy uh, protesting outside dairy farms and I would join uh, SAFE uh, when they do things. So there's, there's such a, a nice way of collaboration between groups mostly grassroots groups which I, I find to be such a beautiful way there's no ego there's no intrigue and I do cubes as well so we used to have uh, AV cubes and now we have make the connect make the connection um, so it's just and you the, even though I, I can I wear my my save my animal save um, t-shirt with pride I have absolutely no problem sharing other people's t-shirt other groups doing their own vigils and and collaborating i basically will do anything oh, that's maybe awesome. that's why i pop up <laughs> yeah it's such a healthy attitude though it's such a great way to be you know because it's all about that bigger picture isn't it why we're doing it not about you know ego or any of that kind of stuff and mm. i love um you know, we, we've been following you uh, for a while, obviously ourselves now, and, and we're sort of friends, even though this is the first time that we've kind of met face to face. And I love seeing your family, even even your daughter has been involved in, in protests. And for me, when I was um, first became vegan, that was really inspiring to me to see your daughter out there doing it, you know, and she's got her signs and everything. And I thought, wow, well, if she can do it, what's my excuse, you know? So yeah, it's it's fantastic everything you're doing. Thank you. Yeah. So, it's just part of the education, you know, it's it's part of what we live and breathe at home. We are all active in our own way. My husband is and my son is more in his social group. So everyone's participating. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful because, yeah, we need activism across the board and from everyone in some form. And um, yeah. yeah, it's just so beautiful to see that. But we kind of touched on this um, before slightly in the fact that there's quite a few people who you know, they want to become activists, you know, they want to get active, but they don't see any local events going on. So they sort of just, it falls by the wayside, you know, and you're quite the doer, you know, you get out there, you're, you're making things happen all the time. Um, do you have any tips for these kind of people who, you know, are sort of waiting for an event to pop up? Yeah, I just, uh, it's funny, yesterday, I was chatting with a new, a, a newbie. And I just said, um, you know, I, I can't see a new person, it, it, their weight, their perceived weight of a new activist is no, is no less than that of a seasoned activist. It's the same. We're all the same. We're all equal. There's no hierarchy. There's no worth. I, there's no, there shouldn't be any egos. But definitely, I try to avoid it at all costs. And so if you're new, just, just join, you know, you, you can just, I, I just received a message, basically a message because someone asked me about some activity and um, and we started chatting. And so that's how we do. And when I was pretty new, I didn't know a, a lot of other activists, but I decided to make a little group. We called it a vegan future New Zealand because we really wanted to embed the word vegan. It wasn't very uh, acceptable at the time and um people used other words uh, and it kind of it, it, i felt it was the wrong thing to do so i just contacted people i contacted carl carl scott in uh, dunedin and jordan wire at the time he was in in vercargill and emma emma uh, emma buyer and apollo from auckland and i just contacted them just because I followed them a little bit on Facebook. I saw their interactions. I thought I liked them and we could actually make a good team. And I just send a message, you know, if you want to do something, there's always a way to, to get in, even through just send a message personally to someone that you follow and you think that you like, or that you might get on with, or you appreciate, or you follow a page of a group that does what, you like to do like save i've been approached by people who want to do vigils and and so forth and so on so there's there's always a way in even if you're not sure and you know even if you're just being uh, a foodie vegan at the time 
the point in time when you want to do some some grassroots activism, then in your group of foodie veganism, you can also ask, hey, I want to do more. Can someone direct me? So don't be afraid. Just just yeah. ask. <laughs> That awesome. I think I think all over the world activists are very keen to 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 help support no, new, you know nourish uh, new new activists. So you will be very warmly welcomed. Well, thank you. That is some brilliant mm. advice. And um, yeah, to all of our viewers here, if you're a new activist, um, get through and have a flick through the playlist for this series because we've got different forms of activism. And if one takes your fancy, there should be a link to that person's page mm -hmm. or their organization and as you say so wonderfully um you know get and send that message out there because we need you all on board and yeah it's wonderful yeah. I, I, i've got to be sending some more messages myself <laughs> definitely definitely yeah it's it's great to reach out and, and once you jump in you know you're away um i know i was interested to read that you had um studied gender and society is a postgraduate degree and so you know learning more about you now um, feminism appears to be one of your passions so um, speaking from us two you know it, it makes perfect sense that that feminism and, and veganism should be kind of going hand in hand and um, what are your thoughts on that oh absolutely absolutely all oppressions are connected um, I strongly believe that. And I wish I could say that when I was uh, studying feminism uh, 20 years ago, I knew that too, but no. Um, now, though, that I've ha I've have, I have the full perspective on, on the animal rights issues, then I know that there, there can't be one without, there can't be one without the other. It has to, you, you have to understand that if you stand against oppression of a race, of a gender, of a sexual identity, of anything, then it is absolutely the. the I think the the atrocity that kind of goes slices through all of them is what we eat, and and how it gets there, and it's the most. I think the most neglected one of all the oppressions, and uh, yeah, absolutely, it's all connected. Mm. I wish. Everyone knew that. It's really hard sometimes to um, address this with uh, activists of other movements. Um, people, people always want to feel like they're doing enough, um, that they're doing a lot and they're doing enough. And then when you come and say, well, actually, no, then they, they tend not to appreciate that. So there is a very um, tender kind of, outreach that needs to be done here mm. yeah like um for myself um, i grew up in a tiny little village in wales of like 200 people and i sort of grew up in this little bubble so there's a lot of these um these isms the these forms of oppression that i really didn't see i was sort of in this tiny little bubble and so um when i went vegan learning about the dairy industry and then you know feminism and dairy you know especially um is a very good place to uh, for sort of witness it um, for someone who was in a bubble like me because <laughs> that's what happens from small villages but um, is there anywhere you can recommend um, checking out you know maybe a book or a website or any other sort of resource for people who want to learn more about feminism yeah well my studies were like um, 20 years ago <laughs> I've completely shifted now to um, animal rights so I don't know anything about new literature I'm not up to date However, I think today, unlike when I was a student, the, um, the web is just so full of resources that you can really, there's endless amount that you can research. Because um, feminist writing is not something that is recent. If you, you can go back to four, 1405, I think, that was when uh, the City of the Ladies if I, I hope I'm saying it right, um, was was written by Christine de Pizan. And that was uh, about uh, women's uh, qualities and, and attributes and contribution to society. And so since then, there were a lot, a lot of feminist writing, uh, but 
when we talk about feminism as a as a social justice movement, we're really talking about the first wave of of feminism around the 1960s, and there's so many canon canonical canon books um, from that era, from you know the the female eunuch uh, German Greer. Um, a sec, the uh, it was this a sec, sexual sexual politics, yeah, by um, by Kate, Kate Miller and um, pornography or men up men possessing women by Andrea Dworkin. I mean, there's so many books that that are so profoundly. I remember reading them for the first time and having like this fireworks exploding in my brain. Um, but yeah. There's so many, but to 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 start with, really, just to understand what feminism, because there are also all, all types of feminism. There's the there's the social feminism, black feminism. There's the first wave, the black, the, the second wave, the post feminism. You know, there's so many types and eras and waves, and so yeah, I think the probably where to start just to understand what feminism is, the kind of oppression it fights, the patriarchy, and the, the lack of equal opportunities. And um, yeah, Google is your friend, because I have to say that I'm not up to date with all the current literature either, because I've completely shifted now to animal rights. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing those. and. Um... Yeah, I'm not sure some of our readers will be uh, hitting into Google now. Actually, um, when we went to the, I think it was the, the big gay out in Wellington. Um, oh, the Pride Festival. The Pride Festival in the park. Uh, when we went there, it was actually great to see all these different types of literature all there, you know, for sale and mm -hmm. um, readily available. Because often when you go to the library, it's not really one of the big sort of headings you see on a, on a section of books. So actually, if you've got an event like that coming up, they're absolutely wonderful to go to, but yeah. you might actually be able to find some more books like that there. Such positive places. I think, you know, when I made the connection between, you know, the whole feminism and, for example, um, how it relates to the dairy industry and, and the way, you know, females of the species are exploited, I just kind of wanted to fall through the floor really because I just thought how did I not see this before um and it leads nicely into you know the the next question which um about your books which I have read um read's kind of an understatement isn't it really I just yeah. kind of like how do you I don't know just consume them <laughs> like <laughs> I could not put them down and um you know both the shed and its sequel liberation are um perfect combinations of your passions for both animal activism and feminism. Can you give our viewers, I mean, I know inside out, but can you give our viewers a brief sort of synopsis of, of what they are about? Uh, yeah, so there are dystopian thrillers slash suspense um, about um, the, pro the protagonist is Sunny. She is um, she's been, she grew up in a farm. The farm is pretty secluded and um, there's no ins or outs really. And that's where she spends her first 15 years or so. And they, in this farm, there's a, there's a big shed where only the women are allowed to go in. And there's all sorts of, of um, people in the farm who wear white suits and um, no one quite, the girls, they don't quite know what these people quite do. And one day the girls are summoned to that shed and um, Sunny is instructed by her mother to run away um, from, from the farm to escape. And that kind of triggers a whole set of <laughs> Um, events uh, firstly she, around the whole event of girls going into the shed what shed what's in there and then what is outside of the farm what is this world that is is the whole setup because it's dystopian obviously so it's not our reality but it's it's almost if if things kept going in the way that they're going this is where we could have, we could end up, I mean, hope not, but um, it's just a variation of reality. And so the, the, the shed is very much um, 
a chase in a way. It's very fast paced chase and uh, thriller. The sequel, Liberation, is going back to Sunny um, and she becomes an activist and she joins this group uh, called the Dairy Slave Liberation Front. And we follow them, we, they are kind of a paramilitaristic <laughs> group and um, we follow them in their various activities to where they try to free other slaves from, from oppression, from, from this slavery and to bring total liberation. And we leave it at this point where it's not completely, it's not a closure. <laughs> so, but, but we do have the, the, yeah, there's quite a developmental going, um, process going on with Sunny. She, she becomes a young woman. She falls in love. She discovers her sexuality and all those kind of things. So all that's happening in the background. Oh, they're, they're fantastic. I mean, yes, like you said, they're suspense thrillers and they literally had me on the edge of my seat. And uh, I know other, other vegans that I've spoken to, both both male and female, have, have felt exactly the same and be like, oh, I what about that bit? And oh, God, did you read that bit? And how was this? And so, you know, it, it really is. I just, it, it's absolutely compelling, both of them. You demolished those books. Like, yeah. I really did. I really did. They're just unput downable. And, um, you know, it, it's so brilliant to see them out there. And as a fellow writer myself, when I went vegan, um, it didn't take long until I felt compelled to use my voice for the animals through my writing as well in a different way. So um, what was it that led you to take up activism in a literary sense and in such a major way as a novelist? Thank you. Thank you very much. I really, it's, it's what I want to, to hear, you know, that people enjoy the books. It's fantastic. Um, I'm a reader and um, I love reading and I just, I was doing all the other activism, of course, but I, time and time again, I was let down by picking up a book, a bestseller, something that was, you know, recommended to me or sent to me or whatever. And every time, every single time you open up and after a few pages, it's the speciesism, it's the eating of flesh, it's, it's that cruelty to animals it's it's in every it's seeped out of the pages and and it's kind of I, and I thought why isn't there a, a, a book that I can enjoy a thriller I love thrillers I love suspense books I love dystopias and that I can just or even detectives and and I can just pick it up and read it and they will not have that element that is so off-putting to me and as as I was kind of seeping in that uh, bitterness of, whoa, there should be more books for, for vegans to read. And I thought, why wouldn't we use this as a platform to actually outreach? And um, the, the shed was kind of brewing inside me for a couple of years until, until it formed enough to, to, to really just pour out of me. And I just, I wrote, I, written, I wrote in about three months, it was ready. <laughs> Just I couldn't stop writing. Um, because I wanted something that we can use as outreach that at the same time we can use to um, educate non-vegans and at the same time can be celebrated by vegans themselves because it's something that you can read and really feel that it's, it's our book, you know, it's ours, it's for us and we get it. And it's, um, it's, yeah, it's, it's the movement book. You know what I mean? Um, I wanted something that my, my children, when they grew up now, my son can already read it. It's 15 plus, but well, he read it when he was 13, but don't tell anyone, but um, my daughter is eight. So when she grows up, she'll read it. And I kind of wanted that book that will be the rite of passage for them to feel proud of and they say this is a book of our movement but at the same time it's not just it's very easily can be read by non-vegan and in a way that they want and well they're shared because the liberation is a little bit more in your face but um it, it's not it won't be or it's not off-putting to non-vegans at all mm. yeah. yeah that sounds really great and um, like one of our previous speakers uh, katrina fox said when 
uh, when you want a book on something and it's not there, get and write it, you know? Yeah, it's so wonderful. And um, yeah, what we really love about uh, your stories is how you're addressing these real world problems uh, from a fictional world. And it's great to see that. And was there anything in particular that really inspired it? Was it uh, your um, your forms of activism that helped to inspire these stories or anything else in particular? I knew that I wanted to write something that will make people really think um, to, to feel how animals might feel. It's really hard sometimes to break that wall and, and explain to people, look, if you were in their place, you would have felt fear, um, joy, um, you know, whatever. And and, um, people have this barrier and it's really hard to to break through it. So I really wanted to make them see through the eye of an animal in a way that I could only make them see is to really put a human. So it's like animal farm. I keep saying that. Uh, Sorry if I'm boring, but it's like animal farm, George Orwell's animal farm, but in reverse. So if if George Orwell wanted to say something about the evil of Stalinism and he used uh, pigs and farmed animals, I do it the other way around. I want to say something about animals and I use humans. Um, And what I want to achieve is that people could actually see, oh, I get it. I get it now. Yeah. Because it's more easy. It's easier for me to relate to a young girl than to a piglet. Awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm, Definitely. And Sunny's a very relatable character. Um, You know, she's, yeah, she's, she's awesome. Love Sunny. (laughs) Um, And I think, you know, we've touched on uh, feminism, but one thing, I mean, as someone who spent a lot of time in farms myself, I never realized until I read your book um, how the males in, in the, the dairy industry and the beef industry are also exploited, you know, apart from in, in the whole breeding um, exploitation. And, you know, so it's this, there's so much that you cover in your book. You know, we, we talk about, um, you know, in relation to the the dairy, the meat industry, the wool industry, we talk about um, dog fighting and in um, you know those who are used as baits and and the artificial breeding. Um, was there a long research process in writing, you know, researching and in, in writing about all these, or was it um, stuff that you've gathered from experience with all your activism, or how did you bring it all together? Yeah, uh, um, I think uh, for uh, um, vegans in general, and especially um, animal rights activists, the 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 research is pretty much part and parcel from in our lives. Because a, you want to be educated, you want to know exactly against what it is you're fighting for, against and for, um, but also to be able to convey that message, to explain, to outreach, to to tell people what it is that is happening because we don't know and the industry doesn't want us to know. That's why they put the uh, gag laws in. They forbid us from whistleblowing and, and taking pictures, not in New Zealand yet, but in other countries in the world, around the world. Look at what happened in Canada with Bill 156 in Ontario. It's a trust absolutely it's an absolute atrocity but um so i think there's been like an eight and a half of however long i'm vegan years of research and i you know watching also earthlings and um um dominion and all those movies um that show you you you, you see how little chicks are born they were just they just hatched in a hatchery and they're going through this conveyor belt and they're squeaking and they're yellow and fluffy if you saw that kind of chick in the farm you would pick it up and you would kind of stroke it and, oh cutie cutie but then it goes into the the macerate you know the the the, the knives and they're grated up alive and there's thousands of them going on so you know 
all the information is there. You don't even really need to do a pro proper research uh, as a non-vegan, of course, um, because non-vegans prefer not to know, prefer to avoid the truth. But we, it's our job to tell them and keep telling them until they see it, because there's no other way. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's my research. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, so we've touched on this as well uh, in these previous questions, but about um, humanizing these elements, you know, by putting humans in the place of the animals and really showing the, what sort of what goes on with the animals, you know, and then showing it on a human effect. Um, is this the way you try and open up empathy to the lay person? Because we know as vegans, I, I feel we have a deeper understanding of empathy. We, we've we try to look further into their shoes, you know, and uh, really see how they feel. And by putting a human in the place, it really sort of opens it up to just your basic level. Um, so yeah, is that how you sort of, you try to open empathy to the general public? Yeah, empathy and, and really understanding because when we, when I stand as part of the, the animal save movement, when I stand outside of the slaughterhouse and truck after truck, comes in with the victims who are going to be killed inside and we sometimes we just lock eyes with one of the victims and in that brief moment that the whole world of that victim it is palpable to us we can feel it we can feel the confusion we can feel the fear we can smell it it's it's reeking emanating from from you know, feces and, and urine and, and it's the whole, the moment is so strong. And then our job is to show the world. And so we use social media to show it, but then you put the videos, you put the pictures, but how can you break that barrier be between the your friend or neighbor or family member who is still eating that kind of animal meat, beef or, or cow um, or sheep that's the kind of animals that we have here there's pigs and other places and chicken but they don't see that they don't feel that palpable moment that connection they they just they see lunch so how can you sh explain to them how can you make them feel um how that animal feels and really that's why i use sunny and her you know friends who are all you know a little sidekick <laughs> and uh, who are um representative of the dairy industry in a way um because it was very, this was the industry that I wanted to concentrate. Firstly, on the shed, and then in liberation, I go forward to 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 concentrate on other industries. But I, because as a mother, uh, who who bore children, and still I didn't get it then. I wish that was the moment, but no. Um, it it just. I just don't get it. How did I not see it then? And I try to make people see. And sometimes people only see when you tell, when you really put them in the state instead of the animal. And um, so, yes, it's empathy. It's understanding. It's that, oh, yeah, moment, that haunting moment that you finally get to, okay, I know, I know now why it's so bad. So it was it's one more way to, <laughs> to reach out to people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like um, as the wonderful Bobby said, Sud said in our um, second episode of this series, um, when we have it online, you know, it's so easy for people just to sort of turn away, you know, or to turn it off. But when you have that that real connection, you know, it's just you, you can't you can't back away from it. You've got to lean into it and. Um, mm. you know, Definitely. And and this is why I wanted to create a book that you found it hard to put down. <laughs> so when you use dystopian thriller or just a thriller or detective or whatever, something that has a kind of a cliffhanger all the time, you, you just jump from twist to twist to twist and, uh, and you can't put it down. So you can't just say, oh, it's that vegan rubbish. <laughs> no, <laughs> you really can't. Because once you immerse into the story, it you really want to know what's what what's going on and 
what what will happen yeah absolutely and and the shed in particular is really clever um you know because you start reading it and i was you know instantly i couldn't put it down but at the same time i was like oh well you know, I wonder when we're going to get to the vegan parts because it's it's not in your face, like you say. And it's like, what makes this difference from other books? And then, you know, all of a sudden I'm like, oh, okay. And you're just constantly connecting. There are so many different ways to connect. And, you know, when Gareth and I, we go on our morning walks and we usually put the world to rights, you know, and, and he's yet to read the book. So I, I can't give away too much of the plot, but we'll be lo- walking along and then all of a sudden I'll be like, oh, that's what she meant to do by doing this. And so, you know, I've still got things coming to me all the time. And, you know, I, I finished the books several weeks ago now, you know, so uh, it's great that that information stays with you and it's not something that you can just keep scrolling or, or turn away from. Um, like I said, the shed is, is quite subtle to start with in liberation, like you say, that gets a little bit more in your face. So the viewers can actually see what the cover So you know like. what to look for. Yeah. And this one here is liberation, which is the, the sequel. And, you know, liberation from the start, it's, um, like you say, it's a lot more in your face. Things really ramp up and um, escalate in the whole fight for total liberation. And, you know, reading it myself and, and, and as a writer as well, but I think even if, if you're not a writer, you know, it must have been so much fun for you to write. Was it quite sort of cathartic to have a world where activists could do everything in their power to free the enslaved? Oh, you bet. <laughs> I was having a ball writing that one, you know, bombarding, you know, <laughs> slaughterhouse and, you know, all the things that we can't do. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I really wanted to give them that freedom to do all these things, to to inspire people not to be violent or use violence, but to really see that, you know, these people will go to, you know, to, to, they will put themselves in danger and they will risk everything, and but they will bring those victims back and they will release them into freedom um so that that was kind of the inspiration that i was looking for not okay make a bomb go to the (laughs) slaughterhouse and that's why i also put this disclaimer in the beginning that i do not stand for violence but i i do stand for camaraderie i think um it's really important when you have your mates your friends your your um your friend activists standing so shoulder to shoulder with you and having your back i do feel that we have established that at least here in wellington but i know everywhere in new zealand you have much the same we do feel like a, a family you know like every family you have a bit of dysfunctional families every now and then you do have your a little bit of of drama sometimes but i i would always say put it to the side because that camaraderie is so important because this is the this this is it's a struggle i wouldn't say it's a war because war has kind of connotation of violence and death but um it is a struggle it's a social struggle and in order to win it and we are going to win it but maybe not in my lifetime but we are going to win it and so we really have to have some people around you to support you and to you to support them because this is it has to have that element of togetherness and and that also is something that i really tried to to achieve in the in liberation especially to to show that even though they are a bit militaristic and they live in this deserted military base and all that kind of stuff but and I gave them no <laughs> no limitation to how much explosions they can cause and uh, destroy buildings. But they always get people out first. So they never kill, they never shoot to kill, and they never set out to cause violence or uh, destroy people. That was very important to me, um, to make it very clear that they never shoot to kill, they would do it in defense, and they always, if they set a uh, building to set to explode, um, the people inside are always set um, taken out first. So, yeah. yeah. It's, it's really awesome to see, yeah, the real, the badass sort of action, you know, sort of coming <laughs> through in that book. Um, but it's when we create something, it's it's incredibly hard to know how people can react to it. You know, whether you're an, an artist, a musician, um, a writer, 
Um, you never really know how someone's going to receive that. And I suppose the question is, you know, can a book literally turn someone vegan? What sort of feedback have you had from the book's launch? You very much never know. And well, I, when I wrote, especially The Shed, I was going through this uh, dichotomy of, of thinking it's fantastic and thinking it's crap. And you, you go through that uh, several times a day. Um, when it was, I had so many doubts, um, but then it, it went, uh, I gave it actually to my friend, Emma, to write, uh, to read and uh, comment on and give me feedback. And she really loved it. And then my son read it and he loved it. He was 13 at the time. He even gave me some suggestions to more scenes, uh, which are now main scenes even, which I love and I put it in. So I got that that feeling that actually, no, it's, it's good. You know, you should be proud. It's a good book. It's great even. And, uh, and people are enjoying it, obviously. So, and then when it came out, I was, you know, you, you let it go. It's like a child that you've been spending so much time and so much energy and pouring your heart and soul into, and then you just let it go. And you sit there and waiting <laughs> anxiety sets in and all that. But I was really surprised. It was really well received and I get a lot of, so liberation only came out February and then boom, coronavirus. Yeah. Hey, so it didn't really get all to that, that kind of circulation that the shed had a chance to have. And, but I still get so many feedback, so many comments for the shed from people who weren't vegan when they read it, but they were maybe on the journey or maybe they thought that it kind of crossed their minds or maybe they thought they were loving animal lovers. And I, I actually can't, can't even count anymore the the messages that I get for people to say it's the book stayed with me for so long for weeks I kept thinking about it for weeks and then it made me change and what happens if one pe- person changed they give it to a friend so they their book is kind of it's you know Sunny is now alive she's alive she's she's got her own life she's changing hearts and minds and because people share it they because they feel oh this book made me really think and maybe it didn't take a day it maybe took three or four weeks or, or a month or more but um but it made me make the change or make the decision and maybe research some more and then you give it out and you hand it out and yeah, so it's fantastic, and I have um, quite a lot of really good, nice, nice comments from people. So yeah, it's. I think it's doing its job, and which I set out to do. This is a part of. The, I wrote the book not to be famous, not to get rich. I wrote it as part of my activism. It's an. It's an uh, extension of my activism, and it's doing its job which is fantastic. Well, thank you so much That's for putting fantastic. it out there. And yeah, we can really understand with um, having a, uh, a baby project, you know, and um, for us, you know, we've written books and we had the same thing with coronavirus. We just published our cookbook and then Corona. Um, yeah. <laughs> and also, you know, even with this project, you know, we really hope we can inspire people to become more activists through this, but it's always that very, um, yeah, scary moment putting it out there and getting out of there. But yeah, as Putting so much of your soul into it and your heart as yeah, well. Yeah, we've really enjoyed the books. And yeah, it's so wonderful to hear that you've had so many people um, having that. Yeah, maybe that seed was already planted, but seeing that seed flourish into uh, more wonderful vegans out there, it's just absolutely sure. fantastic. And yeah, I can't thank you enough for doing this form of activism. Definitely. You're welcome. And your book is also great. We've already used a few, quite a few recipes of it. I can't recommend it enough. Oh, well, thank Very you so good. much. <laughs> thank you. No, much appreciated. It's, um, you know, it's like you say, we're, there's not too many such things as, as, as rich and famous writers here in New Zealand, but it's, it's, it's a labor of love, isn't it? And yours has most definitely been that and having that information that can stay with people and be passed on. One of the things that I liked um, as well is that you managed to do it in a way that is really thought provoking, but non graphic, you know, when I first saw the shed and I thought, Oh, you know, that's kind of ominous. What is the shed? Um, and you know, um, 
there have been a Gareth read uh, Tender is the Flesh yeah, recently. from Magazine mm. of Azterica. Yes, and yes, that, yes. That book is gnarly. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's part of our Vegan FTA book club, and same as your books, you know, are now going to be in the Vegan FTA book club. Absolutely. But, um, yeah, it's great that it's not so graphic in these ones, you know. Like, I, just, yeah. Yeah, I, I was like... Oh, after Tender is the Flesh. Like. <laughs> he was, yeah, I was a bit worried, as you know, this this time it was my turn. I was like, okay, well, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do this one. And, um, you know, because I wanted to read it, but you know, I think like a lot of people, you sort of get put off at the thought, oh, it might be really graphic or awful. And it, it's not, it's more thought provoking than anything um, and exciting. And, you know, you've got all these, these twists and turns and, and it's the imagery, you know, from the start with Sunny and her friends and, you know, everybody in it that just makes your, your book so powerful. Um, having just finished Liberation, um, I could see plenty of potential, like you say. It's kind of left me hanging a bit, you know. Um, the Sunny's in a, in a pretty pretty cool place uh, with what's going on in her life. And I'm thinking, what's, what's next for her? I want to know. Is, is there a third book going to be on the cards? Um, yeah, well, <laughs> when I finished Liberation, I thought, okay, I left Sunny now where I wanted to be. She is in a position where I don't want to give too much away, but she's in a position where she's got plenty to do. But um, and, and it's kind of a it's kind of a cliffhanger. It's not there's no closure, but it's a good place. It's a good place because you can see the future and you can you can tell from your knowing of her through the books that she'll be alright. She'll do really good things. And I kind of thought, okay, that's it. That's it for me. I don't want to do any more sunny stories. But I, since um, I released Liberation, I actually got quite a few calls from people. Oh, no, you have to. You can't leave us like this. You have to tell us how it ends. And um, what's happened? What happens to Sunny next? And the, my, my answer is always, well, I don't know. I don't know what happens with Sunny next. And when I know, it's when I'll write it. And so I... It's starting, you know, and the whole process, it's kind of start. You, you start, it's brewing, it's brewing. And so I'm starting to put the ideas together. It's happening. You can't, I can't control it. I mean, I thought, no, oh, no more, no more sunny. But no, it's starting whether I want it or not. It's come, coming together. I want to give it a little bit of a political uh, element this time because, when you know, we've done the, I'm just in the farm and then we've done the, I'm an activist. Now I want to go to the political level, but it's a dystopian world. It's uh, so I have I have given some hints about what this world is about. It's it's very sparsely populated, and there's not many humans left. It's kind of vast spaces, and even the city, the big city, is small. You know, one you you drive through, and then <laughs> you're in the other side. So th there is a political system. But I need to think it through before I start writing about it, because even though it's dystopian and sparse, there is some form of control. So once I have it all sussed in my head, I'll write it. Oh, we are very much looking yes, forward to that. And, um, <laughs> I'm sure as we find out any more information that might come up, uh, we'll be sharing that on Vegan FTA because, yeah, like well, we're very much excited for this. Definitely. and. Also, yeah, kicking off a vegan FTA book club at some stage so then we can keep up to date with uh, so many of the wonderful authors like yourself. Yes, and really get your books out there where coronavirus kind of put a bit of a, a spanner in the works there. So, um, you know, this is, this is how this, this series came about through coronavirus. So there's always a positive to everything. And, um, you know, we're doing our best to, to get all these forms of activism out there. So, yeah, definitely look out for it in the book club. Thank you. Now, um, within creative activism, there's always sort of a, a delicate balance in an act, I personally feel, uh, when trying to get a message across as opposed to, you know, just uh, producing content to the best of your abilities. Uh, we found in some places there's some people who they've got, um, they've got a cause, a passion that they really want to get out there and it ends up overweighing, you know, the quality of it because it's, it's sort of, I, I want people to know this, you know, but I'm not quite tempering it with it um and it's, it's a real hard balance to sort of keep you know and it goes through all forms of sort of creative creativity whether it's activism or not but um you know in your book you've, you've struck a really wonderful balance of it um how do you try and um 
keep that balance or is that something that's uh, in the process at all for you? I just, I don't know. I, I try to think if I weren't vegan yet and I, someone would give me this book, would I read it? Mm. And if and the answer is yes, because I love thrills, but would I keep reading it? Would I interact with it? Would the message sink in? And if the answer is yes, then that is the kind of book that I'll be proud of and of writing. And this is what I, and it's a very delicate balance, as you say. But if you're, if you're an artist, we have such wonderful artistry in New Zealand. We have artists and we have um, other authors like uh, Sully Altagavaya, and she, she wrote Animal Voices. And we have um, musicians and and people who, who do shows and musical shows and, and they, they perform in individuals. So um, whatever is your calling or whatever you, f- you feel that your creativity is, you know, in the words of Shia LaBeouf, do it. Just do it. Because just believe in yourself. Believe you're good you're good enough. And you can always bounce ideas as well. For, because I had somebody actually ask me if she wrote some chapters in a book, if I would mind reading it and giving her feedback. Of course, yes. Because, yeah, it, it's creativity needs to be nourished and encouraged and celebrated. I think we do quite a good job with celebrating artistry in New Zealand, um, paintings and drawings, etc. I think with literature, literature is like the stepchild of art. <laughs> of art, it's um, being creative with words is not quite up there like being creative with paints and and paint and photography or things like that. And I find when I just released the book, I found it a little bit hard to tell people, Look, this it's for you. <laughs> you know, it's for you. It's not for me. It's for you. Um, and I found it a little bit hard to, to get it through, but I think it's getting better. I think um, with more, we need more. We need more um, artists. We need more authors of vegan slash um, activist vegan, um, animal rights uh, books. So, yeah, we, I, I, don't, I don't see it as competition. I want to see more. It's for us, it's for the animals, it's for the cause, it's for the movement. I encourage it. I want it. So if I can support it and help it, I will, you know, whatever I can do. Well, thank you for that advice. Mm. Um, yeah, one of our, well, I've, I've kind of adopted it off Katrina Fox, but the word of the year is um, collaboration. And it's something that is hugely important to the vegan movement. And yeah. As you say, you know, we're not com- we're not all competition. You know, we're not competing. Absolutely. We're all going for that same end goal. And yeah, that's some wonderful advice you know, to get out there and see what other people think and um, for sure. Yeah, and don't each be, other. Don't be scared. You know, I mean, when when this series started, the last thing in the world that Gareth and I ever thought that we'd be doing would be interviewing Patrick Baboumian on, <laughs> you know, creating an animal rights comic book. But you know, he saw a, a gap. Um, he saw something that he could do, and he just went for it. And I think that's that's what we all need to do. You know, the whole point of this series is to just get people to look at their passions, their strengths, um, the things that they dream of doing and actually do it, you know? So thank you so much for, for getting out there and, and hopefully, you know, there will definitely be more watching this that will hopefully, you know, bite the bullet and, and follow your example and think, okay, what can I do? Yeah, please do. I think, um, one of the, the things I love about your book as well, well, both of the books is that, um, you know, a lot of the, the characters are, are based on real life activists, um, you know, both well known and maybe just sort of known in, in New Zealand or the Wellington scene specifically. But, um, you know, it's, it's a wonderful gesture and it's just so heartwarming to see, you know, I'm reading the whole time. I'm like, oh, you never know who's going to pop up. So mm-hmm. it's, it's great to, um, and to see that there are real people out there inspiring you and your work. Um, is there anyone that you want to give a shout out to <laughs> that's inspired you and, and, you know, put in the book or anyone, anyone at all? It's, it was a really pre- a pleasure to use names of people that I either know personally or I know through Facebook and not personally or 
uh, just follow and they don't know me at all, or even a few celebrities, um, because I, I had to fill a whole bunker full of activists. And I thought, instead of just coming up with names, uh, let's use names that are meaningful to me and in the way that I will honor these people because all these people are all either vegans or activists or both um, that I, I think, you know, deserve the recognition, even though it's not them, it's just the name, it's not their persona. But, um, you know, it's, it's my, it was my kind of way to say thank you to them. Um, yeah, so I wrote it down because I, <laughs> I didn't want to leave anyone out, but I think I still probably have. Um, so Carl Scott is an amazing activist from uh, Dunedin. And Dominic, so we have Carl and Dominic as uh, two people from down south, and they are from the South Island, both of them. Dom, Dominic is Dom Mallard um, from Christchurch. And Jessica, the amazing Jessica Strathby, who is an ex-dairy farmer and uh, now a vegan activist. She, When she read uh, The Shed, she gave me some fantastic feedback. She was so moved by it. And I think from all the feedback that I received, hers was the most meaningful feedback that I got. I absolutely love this woman. Um, Susie and Alice, the two new activists, are uh, actually two activists from Wellington. Um, Susie Hobbs and Alice Rose. Mwah, I love you guys. <laughs> yeah, such an amazing young ladies and uh simon is another name that i use and it's simon lion Lyons from <laughs> flat base he's a chef extraordinaire um and, and a great person i've got a few other names that i don't know in person all these people I actually know um but I, I have other names that i don't know in person some people i like andy just andy faulkner and sully oh sorry sully sully otagavaya i used she is an author um animal voices author she's fantastic but uh there's andy and there's leah leah dollinger uh that i used there's ren ren i used ren hurst she wrote uh writing on the writing on the power of of others it's about uh oppression of horses she used to be a horse trainer uh, of course she doesn't know me at all but i admire her and um there are a few other people I, i'm sure i left people out which is awful and terrible i'm really sorry but you you are in the book <laughs> so we've got peter for peter dinklage we have phoenix for Reva and joaquin we have venus williams we have brian adams we have romish uh ranganathan ranganathan um the comedian um and others there's quite a lot but yeah yeah well that's awesome there's great little easter egg in there and it is um, it really is and when when simon popped up i was like oh, it's got to be it's got to be our simon that we know you know it's just <laughs> wonderful to see him out there kicking butt and yeah i bet he absolutely loved that yeah i feel so blessed to know these people i really do and i you know when i go into actions part of the joy is to stand with I talk about camaraderie, but it really is. It's that quality of people. You feel, wow, you feel overwhelmed. It's, it's that high quality. It's amazing people. They're amazing human beings. And they're all, I don't know, I feel so humble and so honored to be part of this movement that we've got with these people. It's fantastic. Yeah, it really wonderful. is. Definitely makes you feel a bit more positive and a bit more hopeful about the world, you know, knowing that there are such amazing people out there, and like yourself as well. <laughs> Thank you. Now, Thank you. We, we have to ask the really big and important question. Um, where can we find your books and support you, you know, because I'm sure there'll be quite a few these readers. Are, these uh, are what you look for? Quite a few view, viewers who might want to be readers. So <laughs> where can we find them? Yeah, so the main platform is Amazon. You can find it. You can download it on your e-reader from any amazon anywhere all around the world but to order a hard copy book i think you can only do that from the us or the uk um but funnily enough recently a friend told me that i'm also it's also sold through um book depository both of them so they're sold through book depository so i had this urge to google my pen name mc ronan and i did because i never bothered and and then I found that it's actually sold through countless online stores, uh, bookstores. So I think they, I saw Dimux 
and uh, even Mighty Ape. And so I guess if it's if you order it online, then it's really easy to find. Uh, but if you're looking for the hardcover book, then it really is more uh, challenging. I did try to interest um, established um, publishing um, houses. They were very scared of the content because, you know, books about teenagers who kill each other <laughs> for pleasure of viewing on TV, that's fine. But veganism, no. Nah. So, yeah, I actually had one. Um, I, there, there was one agent who was really keen. She said, oh, it's fantastic. It reminded her of the, the book, The Bees. Um, and she said, it's amazing, but I won't be able to sell it. She said, I won't be able to represent you in front of a, of a publishing house because it's not mainstream enough. I think it's rubbish, <laughs> of course, yeah. because it's very mainstream. It's a, it's a thriller that you can immerse yourself in and the message is just a bonus. But, um, yeah, so still not available in stores, unfortunately. So really at the moment is only online. But please go to my – I don't have a website at the moment, uh, but I do have a Facebook page. So it's Facebook uh, slash MC Ronan, MC Ronan, just as it – you know, MC Ronan, just like it's my pen name. And um, if you go to my Facebook page – you will have a pinned post there to show you um, where you can find it with links. And hopefully there will be more links, but um, currently it's really Amazon and Book Depository. And there are a few other establishments like, it used to be a, um, through V1 vegan store. I don't know if they have any copies left, but also uh, the quality free store in Auckland. So th there are a few other outlets where you can find them but what I encourage people is if you can't find it just message me through my page and I'll I'll send you a copy thank you for watching this episode if you'd like to support our speaker then follow the links provided in the description if you're enjoying this content then please subscribe to our YouTube channel leave a like on our videos or drop a comment with something that you've learned your love and support means the world to us and we thank you all for watching this